Hello everyone, in this video we are going to estimate the minimum temperature needed for two nuclei to undergo fusion. So the setup here is that we've got two identical nuclei, each of which has mass m and positive charge q, and in order for these nuclei to fuse together they need to get sufficiently close to each other, but of course the obstacle is that they're both positively charged um, and therefore they're repelling each other. So the idea is that if you make the conditions hot enough, they will be going fast enough um, that they can overcome that electrostatic repulsion and get close enough to actually fuse together. So we can take a step towards making that more quantitative by plotting a graph or sketching a graph of the potential energy due to the interaction of the two nuclei as a function of the distance between them, which is what I've done at the bottom left there. So when the nuclei are quite well separated and the distance between them R is quite large, you get this here, which is a reciprocal curve. So the potential energy U is proportional to R to the minus one. And that's because the interaction between the nuclei at large distances is just electrostatic and it's, so it's determined by the uh, Coulomb potential. So what's going on at small distances then? Well, suddenly, although the Coulomb potential would just keep going up like this, suddenly um, when the nuclei get very close to each other, the strong force comes into play. Strong force is a very, uh, well, strong, attractive, but short ranged force. Um, and so it's, it's sufficient to overcome the Coulomb repulsion as long as the nuclei are close to each other. So this is just shown very schematically here. Basically, you've got some large negative value um, we don't really care about the specifics, but it's, it's large and negative, so it becomes attractive. Let me just write there. That's due to the strong nuclear force. Now, the range of the strong nuclear force is of the order of the size of a nucleus, which is sort of 10 to the minus 15 meters, one femtometer or equivalently one Fermi. Um, and so we can mark on that distance there at which the potential becomes attractive. Uh, let's call that distance D, and let's just say it's about one femtometer. One final bit of setup that we have to do before we start the actual calculations um, is to say something about the speeds of the two nuclei. So what we're going to do is imagine that we're in the rest frame of the nucleus on the left, so the one at the top left there, and we're going to say that the nucleus on the right is coming in with a velocity of v. Now a sensible thing to do would be to take that velocity as the root mean square velocity of a particle in the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Now technically it should really be the root mean square relative velocity because we're working in the the rest frame of one of the nuclei. It can be shown that the root mean square relative velocity in the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is root two times the root mean square velocity in the same distribution. Um, but because we're sort of building an approximate model here, um, we're not working to a level of accuracy where a factor of root two is going to make a difference. So let's just keep things simple and say that that V is the RMS velocity. So let's make a first attempt at actually coming up with an expression for the required temperature. So what we're going to imagine is that we have a particle coming in, the nucleus on the right coming in, um, approaching the nucleus on the left, and we're going to say that that nucleus uh, on my potential energy graph has to be just about where I've just pasted it there, right? In other words, it has to have an energy which is just sufficient for it to reach the peak to, to get past the peak of that potential energy curve and make it into the attractive region. What that means is that all of the kinetic energy that it initially has is converted into electrostatic potential energy and we can express that mathematically by saying that half mv squared, so its initial kinetic energy, is equal to um, the electrostatic potential energy at a distance of d, in other words at this point here where the Coulomb potential has just reached its peak. So we're just going to equate that to Q squared, um, because they have the same charge, divided by 4 pi epsilon naught d. But how is that related to temperature? Well, the temperature determines the typical speed of a particle, and so we can use the equipartition theorem to say that a typical value of half mv squared um, is three halves of kT, where k is the Boltzmann constant. Now that's a straightforward equation that we can just rearrange for t, and if we do that we find that t is q squared over 6 pi epsilon naught kD, where d, remember, is 1 femtometer, or 10 to the minus 15 meters. So numerically, how big is that? Well, if we do this for hydrogen, so hydrogen nuclei, which is a single proton, um, then Q is just the value of the, the charge of a proton. Um, everything else is, is known and we do that and we get about 10 to the 10 Kelvin as a sort of order of magnitude. Let me just write down that specifically uh, for hydrogen fusion. Now, is that actually a reasonable value? Well, it turns out that the core temperature in the sun um, is about a thousand times smaller. And that's the core temperature, right? So like the absolute hottest temperature in the sun is about a thousand times smaller. So let's just write down that that value we've just calculated is about 
1000 times the sun's core temperature. What that means is that our first model was not that great and there's probably some important piece of physics missing because we know that fusion does of course happen in the sun and you don't need a star that's a thousand times hotter uh, to get hydrogen to fuse. A reasonable first thought to have about how to refine the model um, would be to say that well this three halves of kT um, is just the average kinetic energy of a particle in the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Maybe there are some particles that have a thousand times more energy um, and therefore uh, a certain fraction of the particles, the nuclei, would be able to undergo fusion. But what you have to remember is that the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution decays exponentially um, at large energies, and so while there will be particles um, with energy sort of a couple of times the mean energy and even maybe 10 times the mean energy, by the time you get to a thousand times the mean energy, the probability of that happening is just going to be vanishingly small. And so that's not going to be able to sort of fix our model. So it turns out that the solution to this is that we need to include a little bit of quantum mechanics in our model, specifically quantum tunneling. And so in our first model, right, remember we said that the incoming nucleus has to have just enough energy to get over the peak. But in quantum mechanics, we have a probability of quantum tunneling. So what that means is if you have a particle with less energy than the peak energy, if it gets close enough, there is still a reasonable probability that it will go straight through that barrier and go into the attractive region. Now, of course, if you wanted to solve this quantum tunneling problem exactly, you would have to set up the Schrodinger equation and solve the resulting differential equation. That's quite a lot of work mathematically. Um, it turns out, however, that there is a very nice simple way of uh, accounting for this quantum tunneling effect um, without having to do that. Now this method starts off in much the same way as what we did before, so I'm actually just going to copy this conservation of energy equation that we came up with previously and just make one important change. And what we're going to do is say that instead of having to come within a distance d um, of the uh, stationary nucleus in order to reach the attractive region, it has to only reach some sort of further out distance uh, at which there's a probability of quantum tunneling happening. Now, what's the length scale? How do we figure out the length scale for quantum interactions to happen? Well, we could imagine that our nucleus, our particle, behaves like a wave and say that the length scale is the de Broglie wavelength of that particle. So let's call that lambda and just remind ourselves that lambda, the de Broglie wavelength, is Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the moving particle. So let's explore the consequences of this model and see what temperature it predicts. The first thing we want to do is express the momentum in terms of temperature. Uh, it depends on temperature, of course, because the temperature determines the typical velocities um, of nuclei. So um, let's say that lambda is, well, it's h over mv. Momentum is, of course, just mv. Um, the h over m is straightforward, that can stay as it is. Then you've got this factor of one over V. Now we can write down one over V in terms of temperature using the equipartition theorem, right? We know that half MV squared uh, typically is three halves of KT. If you rearrange that, you find that the typical velocity uh, is the square root of three KT over M, but then V is on the bottom of the fraction here. So we're gonna do that upside down. So we're gonna have a factor of square root of M over three KT. Uh, then you combine the masses, so the m only appears once, and you get h over uh, the square root of 3m kt. So then all we have to do is take that expression that we just derived and substitute that for lambda in the conservation of energy equation, right? So what's going to happen? We are going to get q squared over 4 pi epsilon naught as our constant factor. Then it's again, it's 1 over lambda, so we're going to flip that whole thing upside down. So it's going to be the square root of 3m kt divided by h, that's still equal to 3 halves of kt. So let's do a few things with this. First of all, let's multiply by 2, um, and that means your left-hand side is going to be, you're going to have a factor of q squared over 2 pi epsilon naught h. Um, let's also divide by 3k to get rid of this 3k here. You've already got a 3k inside the square root on the left-hand side, so when you divide by 3k, it's just going to end up under a square root in the denominator, and so you're going to have uh, the square root of m over 3k. Let's also divide by the square root of temperature so that this t disappears, and the right-hand side is just root t like that. Then all you have to do is square both sides, and you're going to have your expression for t. So t is um, m q to the 4, and then you've got 12, and lots of squared things, pi squared, epsilon naught squared, h squared, K. Now, how reasonable is that value numerically? Well, again, if we talk about hydrogen fusion, we put the mass of a proton and the charge of a proton into that equation. 
we find that it's about 10 to the 7 Kelvin as an order of magnitude estimate, which is pretty much the core temperature um, of the sun. So although this is not the most in-depth refined model of quantum tunneling, um, just taking quantum tunneling into account in this straightforward way shows that it can pretty much fix our huge order of magnitude problem um, that we had by treating the problem classically. The reason why this works is if you calculate the de Broglie wavelength of a proton um, at this temperature, you find that it's about 10 to the minus 12 meters. And so remember that previously we were requiring our proton to come in to a distance of one femtometer, which is 10 to the minus 15 meters, right? So in the quantum model, the particle uh, can sort of still be a thousand times further away than it was in the first model and still get through. Anyway, I think that's enough for this time. Thank you for joining me and I'll be back with more physics videos soon.